And verse number 11. Father, I pray, Lord, for wisdom and discernment in thy holy name. Amen. Revelation 9, 11. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Bless this word now, Lord. Bless it in Jesus' name. So we have, coming up out of the pit, hell itself. Now, I haven't dealt much with these creatures that come up. You'll find them described in the first few verses of chapter number 9 of Revelation. That's for a future study. But this morning, uh, I'm going to move on from dark matter and antimatter into, uh, into what's happening when we connect that with, uh, with what's going on right now. For example... CERN is about uh, opening portals. It's about reaching into uh, another dimension and various terminology they're using. I'll read some of it for in just a moment. But here's the important part to understand, and I'm going to try to emphasize this from here on out because this is what I see in it. It is the merger of science and religion. Keep that in mind. That's what this is about. And depending on what, uh, what entities involved, what group, what church, whatever, they all have their own agenda, sure. But the bottom line is that it is the merger of science and religion like I have never seen in my few short years on this earth. Now, CERN is uh, to attempt the Big Bang in March, it says, and this was uh, uh, written three months ago. And I wanted to give you one more time, I want to read for you the warning from Stephen Hawking. And uh, Stephen Hawking is, is, uh, is of the discipline of called a theoretical physicist. Now, I found out when you get studying this stuff, you've got all kinds of different types of physicists. And, uh, but Hawking is a theoretical physicist. And he, these are his words. This, this, uh, this opening up, this gate, this, this going into uh, the, what's called the Higgs boson to try to find that could destroy the universe. Now, I want you to let that settle in for a moment because uh, this man is speaking strictly from an academic viewpoint and he says that what's happening in CERN, Switzerland could destroy the universe. Now, let me give you this, this disclaimer and I need to do this constantly with you as we go through this and study this. I am not telling you that I am endorsing anybody that I quote. I am not telling you that I necessarily agree with everything that I give you. What I am trying to do is to lay this out before you for you to consider and think about because there are a lot of possibilities going on here and we need to be informed uh, and informed people are, a, are, are, are uh, armed. Ignorance is very expensive. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, he said in the book of Hosea. So uh, I may give you some hypothetical situations that seem wild and unplausible. But I want you to think about these things because some of the stuff that I give you is going to come from some of the most brilliant minds on this earth. So uh, Stephen Hawking says plainly, that what's going on in CERN could destroy the universe. Well, what is going on in CERN? And I want to read uh, some of the statements that come from these people. And here's what, uh, here's what one says. Sergio Bertolucci, the director of the research and scientific computing at CERN. Here's what he says. The Large Hadron Collider and that's that thing that is 17 miles in circumference, about 300 feet beneath the surface of the earth, the Large Hadron Collider could open a doorway to an extra dimension, and out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it. Now, of course, that begs the question, what do you expect to come out of that door, or what would you send through that door? And the bottom line, he doesn't have a clue because he's in the area that is unknown. And he is, he, he's venturing out 
into the unknown to try to, and this is why Stephen Hawking is so alarmed, is for the simple reason that he understands, to try to put it in layman's terminology, they're messing with something that they cannot control, and they may open Pandora's box, and when they do it, they won't be able to put this creature back in the box. Now, think about it for a moment. Here is a scientist, a physicist, saying, and he's the head of, the, he's the head of CERN, Bertolucci, saying, uh, something could come through that door, or we could send something through that door. Now, what door are you talking about? The door, of, to, to my understanding, would be at the moment that they have collided these, uh, the protons, and I think, but I'm not sure if they're using other uh, 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 particles, but uh, we do know they're using protons. And the moment they collide these and uh, continue to, uh, to uh, do scientific analysis of what they're working with, they're trying to reach the point of what's called singularity. The point of singularity is when they have reduced the particle to its, to its I suppose, to its simplest form, to its lowest state, to its, to it, to its uh, singularity by the word itself implies uh, to the one element, I suppose. I cannot speak scientifically about this. I speak as a preacher of the Word of God and as a student of the Bible. But the point is that once they reach this point of singularity, they have reached what they consider to be the point of where the Big Bang was initiated, where it started. In other words, the elements that came together to produce everything that you know today. And here's the, here's the thing. They do not know many of these elements that came together to produce what you know today. And there, 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 therein lies the, uh, uh, the mystery and the danger that Stephen Hawking's talking about. Now, I believe in my heart that this physicist is trying to say to you and to me and everyone else who will listen, we are about to embark upon, a, embark upon a pioneer effort. We're moving into the unknown. We do not know what's going to come through this door. Uh, in other words, uh, it may be more going on here than simply uh, uh, what physics can define or describe. There, there may be an element here that doesn't fit our, our uh, standard model. There may be something coming through here that we've never seen before. Uh, for example, a creature. A creature. Something that would uh, come through that. Uh, in other words, maybe an extraterrestrial, <coughs> as, they, as they call them. Maybe that would be coming through there. Whatever, who knows? But the bottom line is, something is going to come through that door and he's going to send something through that door. Now we need to keep that in mind because they are opening, as I believe, and I think most of you in here this morning believe, the gates of hell. Now here's what another uh, physicist has to say about the same thing. And here's what he says. The idea of multiple universes is more than a fantastic invention and deserves to be taken seriously. This is Aurelien Barou, French particle physicist at CERN. Now let me read that again. The idea of multiple universes is more than a fantastic invention and deserves to be taken seriously. That's a big statement. That's the kind of statement you need to, to take home and chew on for a while and meditate about. Now here's James Morgan, BBB, BBC science reporter. CERN's governing council wanted to build a kind of time machine that could open a window to how the universe appeared in the first microseconds of its existence. We might even find evidence of the existence of other dimensions. But to conjure up these conditions, the CERN Council knew it needed to perform an engineering miracle. All right, now that we've read what these scientists have to say, let's introduce to you this morning the Vatican. Now, how many of you all, how many of you know when I say Vatican, what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a sovereign government that prints its own money, that sends out its own representatives, just like any other state does in the world but it is also a church, all right? 
Now, I don't know of another church on the face of this earth that has that kind of authority. Do you? Do you know of another church that ha that's a sovereign that can print its own money? But the Vatican does. Vatican astronomers are searching for alien life, say authors. And this is a quotation from the Ecumenical News, May 15, 2015, if you want to follow up on what I'm giving you. Two evangelical authors are set to release a book which claims that Jesuit astronomers at a Vatican-owned observatory in Arizona are using their telescope and another one called Lucifer to search for extraterrestrial life. The telescope is located on Mount Graham in Arizona. And uh, this is a uh, very sacred site to the uh, Indians and Native Americans that live around there. It's one of four sacred mountains, very sacred. Not sacred because, uh, ostensibly, because they bury their dead. It's sacred, they say, because to them it is a gateway. It is a place that opens up to another dimension. And it's strange how that these Indians, these Native Americans, would 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 hold would would believe that would would see it as that and then and then we have such a dog fight that took place for them to build this observatory on top of Mount Graham. Now this is what's said about the observatory that it is the it, it, some have said that it is the most powerful telescope on the face of the earth and that it rivals and some say even surpasses uh, Hubble that is in the sky, that, is, that isn't affected by the atmosphere and what have you the, of, the, of the planet. So they are, they, are, they are peering deep into space and they're looking for something and now they're saying something is coming and they're preparing for what's coming. And it all goes together and presents this scenario for you. And I'll read some of this. What is even more astonishing, the two authors, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, say in their book that the Vatican is awaiting an alien savior. The claims in the book called Exo Vaticana, Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer, and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior are the result of research the two authors conducted at Mount Graham International Observatory. Although Lucifer in the Bible is associated with Satan, the word has its origins in Hebrew akin to light. The researcher also examined Vatican records. Now watch this carefully. While their claims seem too difficult to believe, Horn and Putnam have backed up their research with primary sources. They are, they are currently discussing their findings with the media. On April the 1st, they appeared on the show of American Messianic Jew Sid Roth, where Putnam revealed what they had uncovered in the research. Quote, the records in the Vatican go back centuries, said Putnam, who is a theologian, I read two chapters of history concerning the Vatican's interest in extraterrestrials. They have a whole theology developed around what they call the principle of plenitude, meaning anything God could do, He would do. So they consider the existence of aliens the inevitable consequence of God's omnipotence, omnipotence. And on they go. So the bottom line is that the Vatican, whether they had announced it publicly before, is certainly investing a lot of money and effort into finding and communicating with these aliens. <coughs> Ask yourself this question this morning. Now, we've had science fiction movies all of our lives. We grew up with flying saucers and all that stuff. Uh, I've told you time and time and time and time and time again, I do not believe UFOs uh, originate from up there. They originate from here. However real they are, they are demonic. That's what I believe. And I haven't seen anything yet to shake my belief in that. But I do not doubt the existence of UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, the Loch Ness Monster, all these other, uh, they call it cryptozoology. You get into a field of cryptozoology, you get into all kinds of stuff. Blow your mind of what's out there. The lizard man, the moth man up in West Virginia and all this stuff. They belong in the field of what's called cryptozoology. And uh, you, 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 spend, you could spend months just studying that. But here's, here's, here's the bottom line. There is a connection, apparently, between the appearance of UFOs and Bigfoot and the moth man and the lizard man and whatever, whatever other... Uh, uh, manifestation you talk about, 
there seems to be a correlation going on between the UFOs and these things. And let me add you add this while I'm on UFOs. This is not about UFOs today, but this is important. You would be amazed at how many people who have sighted UFOs or had contact with UFOs and what have you have had supernatural paranormal experiences after their UFO experience. And you would be amazed at how many people that have had UFO contact and what have you, they have received messages from these beings in the saucers and what have you about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that is amazing. I did a study on this a few years back and I marveled at how much they want to tell you about Christ, where he came from, who he is, and what the gospel is about from, from these UFO uh, uh, green men or whatever you want to call them, grays. They've got categories for them. They're not all gray, some green, some gray, uh, some lizard-like, some uh, reptilian and all kinds of stuff. And, and you've got a crowd on there today on the internet if you want to get on there. And, and, and start tracing it, you'll be amazed at how they'll take the photograph and they'll take Hillary Clinton, they'll take Barack Obama, they'll take anybody they please and they'll draw and put a close up and they'll give you slit eyes like this and say they're reptilian. So there's a lot of crazy stuff on the internet. I mean, just plain crazy wild junk. And so, you know, we try to stay away from that, but to, to keep with the Bible and keep with the facts, and the facts are definitely this, people have had UFO contact and they have had supernatural manifestations. They have had paranormal experiences. That has happened, is happening, and will happen. What I'm trying to say is that the Vatican now is connecting with ET, extraterrestrials, and the Vatican is doing it in a scientific way. Remember, the thesis of this lesson this morning is that science and religion is merging. And that's what's so very important because our country is full of people who fall at the altar of science. Their life is dedicated to science. As the apostle said, science falsely so called because it's not true science. Anything that denies the reality of God, his creator, his sovereignty, and all the rest of that is science falsely so called. But anyway, the Vatican is preparing for a communication from ETs. Uh, L.A. Marzulli on his uh, website says, here's a link to an article that discusses the Vatican and ETs. With everything that is posted here in regard to UFOs, use your own judgment discernment. This is what we know. It would appear the Vatican has defined its position regarding the possibility of extraterrestrial life from other planets. In short, the Vatican has stated and does so again in this article that ET may exist and if so may not be an in may not they may not be in need for a savior as they may not have been a fallen from grace. And so forth and so on. Are you following the pattern here? Are you following the message that they're going to give you? Uh, uh, and remember, the, the present Pope, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in just the few, last few days, he had a meeting over there in the Vatican. He welcomed, uh, what's, the, what's the fellow's name who's the head of the Palestinian Authority? Mahmoud Abbas, I think that's his name. Uh, he took uh, Yasser Arafat's place when Arafat was poisoned to death. Mahmoud Abbas is the leader of the Palestinian Authority who is funded by Iran, a terrorist organization, has been, no, no question about it, that's, a, that's an irrefutable fact. <coughs> but in any event, uh, the Pope meets with them and calls Mahmoud Abbas an angel of peace, something like that, and then says, and then recognizes a Palestinian state. Uh, how many know that? How many's heard of that? All right, how many, how many this is the first time you've heard of it this morning? All right. Uh, the problem with the mainstream media is that everything, all the news that you ever get from the mainstream media is filtered through an agenda. That's fact. That's fact, folks. But anyway, the, the Palestinian state, now here's number one. There never was a Palestinian state. There never was in history a Palestinian state. Number two, when Israel came into the land, the UN mandate was over. They offered for the Palestinians to sit down and draw up a resolution dividing the land up. They refused. They refused. Number three, Israel is in that land because of a promise from God 
in Genesis 15, that land belongs to Abraham and his descendants. And then God said, I will curse him that curseth thee and bless him that blesseth thee. Now, you take, you take Pope Francis' statement about a Palestinian state and marry that with what Obama has just said and what he has just done in the way he has treated Israel, the way he has come publicly against them, and the way that he is forging this so-called alliance with Iran. And now Obama has not only a problem with Israel, he's got a problem with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, all those Muslim Gulf states. He had a, he had a Camp David summit just the other day, and I think he had, had invited six or seven or eight or nine, however many, I don't know how many, I didn't count it. He invited these, the heads of these Gulf states to sit down with him and, 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 and work out their understanding and agreement among themselves about America's uh, protective uh, cover uh, for, the for, for, the, for these Gulf states, these Arab Gulf states. And, and uh, three or four did not show up. One in particular was the king of Saudi Arabia. And the reason the king of Saudi Arabia did not show up is because Saudi Arabia is a Sunni Muslim country. Iran is Shiite. And Saudi Arabia, along with a lot of the other Gulf states, see Iran as extending their hegemony into these countries on, on, on this area. They're reaching out and they're taking, they're just grabbing, grabbing land, grabbing authority. They're taking, sweeping it in so that Iran becomes a, a, uh, a superpower, a regional superpower down there, supported by Russia and, and uh, their alliance with uh, Assad with Syria. All that's going on. And they do not trust Barack Obama. They believe that he has lied to the American people and, and the world about Iran's nuclear capabilities. They believe that he has a secret agreement with them that they, he will allow them to have a nuclear weapon. And so Saudi Arabia's last word is this, we will develop a nuclear weapon to counter uh, Iran. What have you got? You've got what's called nuclear, nuclear proliferation. You've got an arms race going on again. You see, folks, uh, the, people, the people in this country, the ruling elite in America, have nothing but contempt for you. They think you're stupid. They think because they tell you something, you're going to believe it. But the rest of the world's not stupid. They're watching, and they know what's going on. And they know that this agreement with Iran, John Kerry running over there and trying to make up an agreement with them, he, makes this, he, he tries to do this agreement with Iran, and the leaders in Iran get up and tell the people, well, we're not going to, whatever agreement we sign with them is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, we don't trust Obama, and on and on and on it goes. And that's what you're getting into right now. But here's what's happening. When the Pope, who is the head of a church of 1.2 billion people, that's a bunch of people, recognizes the Palestinian state, and calls Abbas a angel of peace. He is weakening Israel, and he's creating an, an atmosphere of anti-Semitism that's already here. He's feeding it more. And what's happening is he's going to force Israel into a position where they have to sue for peace. Because if the Catholic Church has turned against Israel, and they haven't for all of them haven't, but he has. If the Catholic Church turns against Israel and embraces the Arabs, and Iran is building a nuclear weapon, and the United States president is definitely anti-Israel, what do you think those Jews are going to think over there on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean? It wouldn't surprise me one bit if you don't see them launch a strike against uh, Iran. Because I heard a word the other day, and I don't know how accurate this stuff is, because all we know is what we read in the papers. We don't have anybody in here with connections, with high-level connections. You know, I read what one, one guy said about what he read about somebody else who read what he thought somebody else thought when they read what he read what he read. That's what we get. <laughs> all we get is what's spoon-fed to us through the media. But I, I heard that, the, uh, that Iran is just a, just a few months away from a nuclear weapon. And as you know, the Shiite is, is uh, definitely so much different from the Sunni Muslim because the Shiite's looking for their Mahdi. And they believe that a, 
a conflagration, a, 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 a worldwide upheaval is going to be necessary to bring the Mahdi back. And that's what Mahmoud uh, Ahmadinejad had said time and time again. We'll destroy you. We'll drive you into the sea. They've said that to Israel. And it seems like our president has long since forgotten the threats that came from Iran. Apparently he doesn't really believe that the threat of Iran against Israel is a real threat. He doesn't, he believes it's, he apparently thinks it's bluster. He thinks that they're just saber rattling. I don't. I believe that Iran will do exactly what they said they would do. Just like when Chamberlain waved his little paper and said, we're going to have peace in our time, Hitler had told them in Mein Kampf what he intended to do, and he did exactly what he intended to do. He wrote it out. He spelled it out. And he did it. And then the world was shocked to find out that he built all these concentration camps and killed all these Jews. But he told them what he was going to do. Alfred Rosenberg was his, was his minister of propaganda when it came to that, and he laid it out for the people. They had been building an atmosphere of anti-Semitism in Germany for decades. It, listen, Hitler did not bring anti-Semitism into Germany. It was already there. It was, it was long established, and it was established through occultism. And, uh, and all he did was fan the flames and used it. And he, was, he was, uh, used it for his own purposes. Anyway, let's get back on this thing here. The uh, extraterrestrial savior. Now, this is, this is important. This is important. Yesterday, Pope Francis celebrated his first Easter. Now, this is from uh, Michael Sala, the Examiner website. Yesterday, Pope Francis I celebrated his first Easter Mass, the leader of the world's 1.2 billion Roman Catholics. In his first Urbi et Orbi speech, Latin for the city of Rome and the world, he called for peace in the Middle East and end of, suff of human trafficking and greed, preventing the exploitation of national natural resources and protecting animals by becoming responsible guardians of creation. The Pope normally gives and so forth and so on. In Exo Vaticana, Chris Putnam and Tom Horn predict, now watch, listen carefully to what I'm saying, that the new Pope, Francis I will soon announce the existence of extraterrestrial life, among whom an alien savior will emerge to reinvigorate Christian teachings. Putnam and Horn successfully, listen carefully, listen carefully, Putnam and Horn successfully predicted in their last book, the best-selling Petrus Romanus, the final Pope is here, that Pope Benedict would resign rather than die in office. A year before it happened, they predicted it would happen. Now meditate on that for a minute. That had not happened in 600 years. Where did they get that from? Did they get that from a Vatican insider? Did they get that from this, from studying this uh, St. Malachi, the prophecy that he gave? That's what they say. But that is a profound thing to say. Like right now, I would say to you, in six months, Francis is going to resign. That would be like me saying that. You'd say, well, we'll find out. You know, it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. You hear these Prophecies, they get up, you know, and they give this word of knowledge from God. Well, the sun's going to come up over here, and it's going to rain over here, and this is going to happen, and then nothing, nothing. But when you start naming people and dates and places, you got something. And when they say that Pope Benedict is going to resign in a year, and then he resigns in a year, you just said something. And that demands uh, attention. So they're saying that the Catholic Church is going to reveal an alien savior. Notice carefully how that the Catholic Church is associated with the savior. Notice carefully how that the Catholic Church, therefore, is the minister, the ministration, the liaison, the connection between salvation and mankind. And they've always taught that. They teach it to this day. They teach that salvation is only through the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we've got E.T., we've got CERN, Switzerland, we've got uh, the Bertolucci saying that we don't know what's coming through that door. Here we are. 
We've got it coming from every direction and it's all pointing to the same thing. Something is about to show up that's going to be the Savior and it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Many shall come in my name. Many shall say, here is Christ, there is Christ. You know, the point is confusion. God's not the author of confusion. It's something to think about. And then when you see how that he has personally uh, attacked Israel, you begin to, you, you, it's, it's, you know, <clears throat> you don't judge a tree by the words that come out of it. You judge a tree by its actions. You judge, it, you judge a tree by its fruit, in other words. What does it produce? What is this man producing? What's he producing? He's producing a, an alien savior. He is diminishing and belittling Israel. And he's pointing the attention toward, toward, uh, toward the heavens. And now we've got a scientific, high science over here in CERN, Switzerland, that is about to open the door, the gates to hell. Who would have ever thought a few years ago that we'd be in a scenario like this? I sure didn't. I remember back when I first came to Temple, 30-something years ago, the boogeyman, I mean, he was to blame for everything, was the Soviet Union. And that communism was going to take over the world and atheism, you know. And I mean, book after book after book, and everybody had figured out, and that's the way it's going to be. And it was all about Gog and Magog. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be that anymore, does it? No, it doesn't. Yes, sir. Yes. But Jacob calls it a gate to heaven. Yes, he does. The word gate's in there. And it says, and he said, he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Yes. Yes. So you, are you hearing? Are you listening to him? All right. Now, turn to Revelation 4 and verse 1. Revelation 4, 1. After this I looked, and behold, a what? Yeah, that's another word for a gate. A door was opened in heaven. Now where that was, God Almighty knows. But, it, you know, it's not left to us to know. A gate, a door, a doorway into heaven. The Lord Jesus says, I am the way. He said, I'm the door to the sheepfold. <coughs> now, Tom Horn is a prolific writer. Chris Putnam is his, is his uh, 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 I don't know what good word to use for that. He's, he says he's a theologian. It, it appears to be a, a, an honorable and a decent man. I don't know how close their alliance is, but the two of them go together a lot. But here's the thing. Tom Horn is a prolific writer. Now, he's coming out with a lot of stuff, folks, a lot of stuff. I've read a lot of his stuff, a lot of it. What I try to do, though, when I read stuff like that, is to find corroborating testimony, or in other words, uh, some some uh, some uh, uh, some some research from a different source, uh, if possible, a primary source from another place. And uh, I have found that uh, Mr. Horn has quoted many people, many sources, many authorities, which are which are uh, uh, believable. They're acceptable, and they're the kind of things that we can we can rely upon. So. He, he quotes these authorities, he quotes this, this material, then he comes out with assumptions. But he, he gives you a, uh, a uh, disclaimer by saying, now, if this happens, or it could happen like this, which is the best way to deal with this stuff, because there's so much going on, so very much going on. So I want you to keep in mind that I use a lot of Tom Horn stuff, but it doesn't mean that I am a Tom Horn disciple. I'm using his material. I'm doing a lot of praying about what I'm studying so that I'll be able to stand up here and be, and be able to give you a, 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 some kind of an understanding, a lesson, a, a perspective on this 
that, that fits the scripture. Are you following me on that? This is why, it's, this is why plagiarism is such a terrible thing. <coughs> plagiarism, folks, is when you use someone's material and claim it to be your own. That's plagiarism. And some of the biggest names that you've ever heard of are guilty of plagiarism. And now sometimes you can innocently overlook giving credit to whoever it belongs to. I've done that. But when you come across as if it is your material, you are original with it, and you, ref and you fail to give the, the, the credit to the original source, that's plagiarism. That's a bad thing. So what you get into with this stuff, when you get on the internet and start reading this material, you're going to find he quoted him, who quoted him, who quoted him, he quoted him, he quoted him, he quoted him, but they don't uh, give you the source of the quote. <laughs> they, a lot of these people act like it's their own material. And that's what you're getting into today. And Satan can use this to create a lot of confusion. So let me put it simply as I know how. I do not trust the Vatican. I know their history. They have persecuted Christians. They have persecuted Jews. They have burned Jews at the stake. They have burned Christians at the stake. I do believe that there are saved people in the Catholic Church. I do believe that. I certainly do. I believe there are saved people probably in all of these Christian churches. There's a certain number in there who love the Lord and know the Lord Jesus. I do also believe that the, low, the closer you draw to Christ and the more of His words you learn, it begins to give you the spirit of discernment and there comes a time when God says to you, now do you, are you in the right place? And He needs to move you from there. Now that said, a lot of critics of the Vatican, like Malachi Martin, who's a Jesuit priest, and others, have made observations about what's going on inside the Vatican. We would do well to listen to these people. Why? Because first of all, they're insiders. They know what's happening. But always, with this caveat, always remember who they are, where they're coming from, and consider if they have an agenda of their own. Because that's very important to understand that. I do believe that angels fell in Genesis 6. I believe the fall of these angels, Peter talks about, who kept not their first estate. I believe the product of this fall was giants in the earth. I believe that the pagan world picked up on that understanding, as limited understanding of it. That's where their gods and goddesses came from, through the Greek culture and the Roman culture and Hinduism and all the rest of that. You can trace it all over the world. I believe the Bible is absolutely true when it talks about this. The Lord Jesus Christ says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, we're talking about angels who kept not their first estate, came to the daughters of men, Genesis chapter number 6. That happened. I believe that happened. Then that tells me, well, it's possible, then it's going to happen again. That means that we can look to see something similar to that. Uh, whatever method's used, I don't know, but I believe that. I, I believe it. I'm a Bible believer in that sense. I also believe that in the last days, and I believe I'm in the last days, that we are going to be dealing with a time of unprecedented deception. What do I mean by unprecedented? Unprecedented means it has never been this bad before. Unprecedented deception. Mind-boggling deception. And we have to be alert. We've got to really do some praying and sincerely seek the face of God in, when we're dealing with this stuff because it's happening so quickly. I was talking to a brother right here, that Brother Valance, this morning before we came in, September the 23rd of this year. This may be the first time you've heard that date, but September the 23rd of this year is supposed to be a very important date as it relates to the second coming of Christ and the revelation of the Antichrist. To just put it in general terms, the Antichrist. Well, how far is that from here? Well, folks, we're already in June, nearly. We're only talking about a, a period of a little over thir uh, three months, a little over 90 days. I haven't counted it out. You can figure the math on it. Yes, sir. Uh, you might not realize it, but 
the September 23rd is the dawn of the four. And that's the Day of Atonement. That's supposed to be the, 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 the last blood moon, which we all live by sight. I mean, most people live by sight, but we live by faith. Right. And the coming of Jesus Christ is not determined by any date. Right. It's determined about when he's coming for his bride. And nobody knows that. But this stuff is really being bombarded on the internet. And they're trying to Numbers are very important to the occult world. The number 13, the number 33, and other numbers are very, very important to the occult world. Also, the King of France, May of last year, said that there would be 500 days until a major catastrophe was going to take place. If you count from the day that he started to the 500 days, it comes on 9 so, and they said a couple, uh, first this year they said they have 300 more days. And it just keeps going on. Okay. Now, here's the possibilities. Here's one possibility. They feed that to you. Then you take a stand on it. And you make a big deal about it. And then when nothing happens, they make a fool out of you. Exactly. And they diminish you in the eyes of the people. I've got a book in the office that says 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 88. I've got that. I don't know how many times down through the years, date setters have set dates for the coming of Christ. And, you know, and they, they continue to do that. All right, with that said, 9-23-2015 is written in stone. Is it? Okay. Say, so why is it written in stone? You've stuck your neck out, neck out there. You've said it's going to happen at such and such a time. You've got your, you've got, you know, you, you, here you are. And if nothing happens on 9-23, then what? Here's what uh, one guy was a big radio. Uh, he said, well, I have to readjust my, my figures. I missed it by a year. It's going to happen next year. I remember that happened if not too long ago. Next year. Well, next year came around. Nothing happened. See what I mean? So what, what do you believe, preacher? I'm going to watch 9-23. I'll be watching. <laughs> I'll be watching. If I'm here, we may be gone. 923 may take place in the tribulation period. If, if man says that something's going to happen on that particular day, you can count on it's not going to happen. Something's going to happen. I'll talk about that. Now, Isaac Newton was a physicist and he was a Christian. He's an Englishman, lived back, I think, 1600, somewhere in there. Very brilliant man, folks, brilliant man. And he talked about some kind of a prophecy that's coming up. And I haven't done much, enough reading into it, research on it, to speak uh, intelligently about it, but I will. And maybe next week, Lord willing, we can talk about this 923 that's coming up. See if he has a connection with it. I don't know. There may be a connection. Let me read this for you before, before we close out the, the lesson here this morning. How many of you remember President Eisenhower? Dwight David Eisenhower. Now, he was a, he was a, he was a, he was a warrior. And he came out of World War II. He was the commander of all the Allied troops in, in uh, Europe and a uh, five-star general. And he became the president. And uh, uh, there's some, let me just read it for you here. Uh, former President Dwight David Eisenhower had three secret meetings with aliens from another planet. Now listen carefully. Here's the source. Here's the source. A former U.S. government consultant has claimed the 34th President of the United States met the extraterrestrials at a remote air base in New Mexico in 1954, according to lecturer and author Timothy Good. Here's a name. Now, here's the source for this. This is the Huffington Post, 14 February, 2012. And you can, go, you can type this in, Google it, and you'll find all kinds of references to this. But the source is Timothy Good who says that President Eisenhower met on three separate occasions with aliens uh, from uh, whatever, however they appeared to him, and what have you, so forth and so on. And there's a whole lot more involved in it, and we don't have time to get into it. But it's very interesting, if you'd like to do this, to do a study, and I read just a, a cursory study yesterday, of what the presidents have said about UFOs. And you'll find that President Reagan 
President Reagan probably said more about UFOs than uh, any of the other presidents. They've been very careful about what they say about UFOs, and I can understand why. I can understand why. But uh, they don't, uh, they haven't just come out flat out and denied them. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, you could, you, you could uh, yeah. Or another way to look at that would be that the gate to hell has two gates that swing open, you know, like that. Uh, two gates entering into one portal or one uh, bottomless pit. And, yes, sir. There's two. Yes, sir. <laughs> I understand where you're coming from, brother. I understand all about it. <laughs> we had a place here in Knoxville, Tennessee about 30 years ago called Malfunction Junction. I don't know if any of you ever remember that. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I got caught in it more than once. Malfunction Junction. <laughs> oh, yeah. I grew up in this town. Pardon? They just moved it, didn't they? <laughs> oh, man. I remember when they built the interstate. I grew up on Beaumont over there, and when they cut that interstate through, we used to go over there and play on that thing when we were kids. So I, I watched Knoxville grow. Malfunction Junction. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll let you go. All right. Brother Valance, will you dismiss us, please? Trust in you.